When we tell our friends that we work on AI safety related topics, they usually say, wow, this is related to the future and they think about killer robots and self-driving, whatever. And um, I like to tell them that um, AI safety is related to things that are already affecting us. This is Emma Diem Hamdi, a PhD student of the SE School at EPFL. Medi's research is about safety measures for machine learning systems. An example of a killer robot that is already deployed around us and already affecting people uh, is the recommender system of social media. We tend to think that AI is this futuristic gadget, but AI is already here and it's affecting billions of users every day, especially through recommender systems. Those recommender systems, for example, uh, and as many studies show or suggest, at least with strong evidence, uh, tend to favor polarizing uh, opinions. And some studies go even further and link them to, for example, the surge of uh, anti-vaccine positions uh, in Western Europe and in North America. Of course, uh, the anti-vaccine position existed uh, from long ago, but uh, we can question whether it was fueled uh, or not by the recommender systems of social media, and many researchers say yes. Let's give numbers to have a sense of the scale of the issue. The French uh, health Institute uh, Linserm, um, in one of its uh, reports, uh, re reveals that 1.7 million, so 1 million 700,000 vaccine preventable infections uh, occurred in the last 10 years. Uh, of course, this is not necessarily always related to social media or anti vaccine conspiracies. Uh, and in the US alone, some uh, report that up to 1. 1,500 deaths per year uh, are due to uh, vaccine preventable diseases, such as measles. AI recommender systems are arguably already a matter of national health in developed countries. So that's why I like to tell uh, my friends that the AI safety I'm working on is the one that is already killing us, not yet the one that is to be deployed. Of course, if we solve some of the problems related to this already deployed basic, very primitive form of AI, that is a recommender system, uh, we would have a better hope to be prepared for the upcoming more developed forms of uh, artificial intelligence. So AI systems may be highly influencing the health of the people, but what does this have to do with AI safety? Say that um, you are a recommender system of videos. And then uh, uh, there are people uploading content in your, in your platform uh, with tags and titles and keywords and, and semantic uh, objects that will tell you that this is somehow related to uh, uh, health advice, medical advice. So th th you can classify videos as medical advice. Um, but that's how people upload content. And um, when I look for medical advice for children, your recommender system would suggest something that it thinks is relevant to me. What if a malicious user of your platform uploads a lot of videos telling young parents, do not take your kids for vaccine? and your recommender system thinks it is relevant to me. If I'm exposed to this kind of content uh, on a regular basis, um, it is very easy to make me convinced that maybe I should not take my kid for a vaccine. This example is part of a more general framework known as adversarial machine learning. Exactly, so this term adversarial machine learning uh, is uh, well covered in the last two, maybe, or three, three years in the media, but uh, mostly on one side of it. And adversarial machine learning has at least three sides. So what's the first one? The first one is what we call evasion attacks. So you train a machine learning algorithm, and after you train it, 
I'm a, as a malicious uh, agent, I will find some input that will make your machine learning algorithm misclassify the input. For example, if your machine learning algorithm is an airport security detector, I might find a way to 3D print um, a gun and make your airport security algorithm think it's just a, a doll in my bag. So I will have evaded your detection. So this is the most covered aspect of adversarial machine learning. What's the second kind of adversarial machine learning? There is a second aspect where I would query your algorithm to try to infer the data you used to train it. So and then maybe if you train it with health uh, data, um, I would infer your patient's information and that's something you don't want. This is called exploration attacks. I explore what's, what you use to train your algorithm and uh, I would uh, infer private or sensitive data of your patients, and this is something you don't want. This is mostly tackled by people who work on differential privacy, for example. What's the third and final kind? The third aspect is called poisoning attacks. So when you are still training your algorithm, I would inject bad data. For example, I would inject a video telling you vaccine is very dangerous, while vaccine is something that medical experts agree uh, on their safety and their necessity. So I will inject this kind of data or saying maybe yeah, some pseudo-medicine solution is very good to treat cancer and label it as medical advice. So this is not medical advice. And try to push you, to push your algorithm to think that pseudo-medicine this pseudo-medicine solution indeed treats cancer. And for example, you would suggest it to other people looking for medical advice on your platform. That is called poisoning attacks. So I poison your learning. Medis research is precisely about resilience to such poisoning attacks. In our work, we try to encompass the poisoning attack problem inside a broader uh, question called a Byzantine fault tolerance. And Byzantine fault tolerance very quickly has to do with uh, situations where you would like a group of agents, they can be humans or computers, uh, come up with a common decision robustly, even though some, some members of the group are malicious or misbehaving. Now we will have an upcoming video on how to guarantee Byzantine resilience, but let's get back to the anti-vax example and generalizations of it. The research, this research direction opens up uh, way more important questions. So what, what is the best way to aggregate preferences, for example? So the why I mentioned, I mentioned the topic where a good decision is relatively easy. A good medical advice is a medical advice on which experts, like National Health Institutes, uh, INSERM in France, or CHUV uh, in Lausanne, the, the University Hospital, or I don't know, the John Hopkins uh, Medical School, etc agree on. Let's say like there are consensus on that. There is a consensus that babies should take uh, measles vaccine. So th this is an easy, this is an easy question to like, we, we know what is a good uh, way to aggregate uh, preferences because there is a strong consensus between experts. This is a technically easy question. But then when it comes to politics or uh, even sports, uh, what is the best way to aggregate opinions on the golden ball? Or what is the, um, the way to aggregate people's opinion on the current trend in politics? And this will affect their vote. So those are, those are really hard questions. And it boils down to social choice and preference aggregation and an important question in game theory. There are more views on YouTube than searches on Google. People are more influenced by what they view on YouTube than by what they search on Google. And the, the thing that's even more uh, concerning is the fact that most views on YouTube, more than half of the views on YouTube, are recommended views. The problem with reinforcement learning as a learning paradigm is that you create artificial intelligence whose objective is uh, a bit scary, gets as much reward as possible. 